slow the game down to a crawl. It's bad enough the coaches have destroyed overtime and we'll get there. Now they want more and more video review and slowing the game down. And after every whistle, everybody gets the eye. The <laughs> NHL, oh, oh, I'm oh. here, so you're oh. going to be here too. Oh. What a slogan. <laughs> Welcome once again to 32 Thoughts, the podcast presented by the GMC Sierra Elevation. Jeff Merrick, Elliot Friedman, Dom Shramati. So Elliot, I want to launch the podcast today by reading a tweet to you. It's going to remind you of the old iDesk days. Let's go down to Merrick and Morrison, read some tweets, guys. Here we go, Elliot. Okay, let's here's go. One I, here's one that I got on Thursday. Uh, listen to the pod today. This is the podcast from the radio show. Love the video coach segment. This is the conversation, Elliot, that you and I had about video coaching on Thursday on the radio show. I yeah. love the idea of them getting praise after the game in the locker room and stuff. Just wait until Torts healthy scratches his video coach after a bad review. That comes from <laughs> Jonathan Morris. I think that's probably a good way to set up today's 32 Thoughts podcast. Uh, we're going to get to John Tortorella. We will get to video coaches. We will get to Florida. We will get to the Islanders and the Red Wings and a lot of other things today. But do you want to put a, a quick bow on the uh, on the Florida uh, Florida GMs meetings. I mean, this was about in a lot of ways GMs and GB Gary Batman. Let's start with the managers themselves. Anything spicy for you come out of this? Well, I, I think the only thing like I've written a lot about it and we've talked a lot about it. And one of the things that I, I do think is is going to be interesting here is that. There was some talk going in. Would there be a showdown between uh, George Peros mm. and some of the managers over uh, some of the suspensions or the processes? I understand there was one manager who had some pointed questions. Now, it's all in the eye of the beholder, right, Jeff? You know, yeah. sometimes people think, oh, this is a really intense argument. And other people <laughs> are like, meh, it's just two alphas going at it. And uh, I, I think that that was one of the things that kind of said to me, like I, I did have some people say to me, wow, like Peros really got challenged. But I got some other people who said, Really, you thought that was a challenge? I didn't think that was a big challenge. I just think it was two people kind of giving it to each other a little bit, and it really wasn't that bad. And also, the commissioner was around for a bit of that, so people are always a little bit more careful whenever <laughs> uh, Batman is in the room. So whatever the case was, and, and some other people said to me, yeah, someone challenged Peros a bit, but he had good answers and he was ready uh, for them. So whatever the case is, I don't think it was too bad. One of the, the things that came out of it to me is and I didn't write it. The, someone called me about it on, on Thursday. And uh, so I had better picture was, you know, for example, at this meeting, they were shown 14 examples of plays at the blue line. And they wanted to know, like, do you think this is onside or do you think this is offside? Like hmm. Minnesota Wild fans would know there was a play with Marcus Johansson where he was ruled to be offside. And some of the managers looked at it and said, I don't know, I think that should be a goal. So that was one of the things they do here. And Colin Campbell is really well known for this. If there's a goaltender interference play or a somewhat controversial play that they review, he will send it to a group of managers. He doesn't always do the same ones. I think there's some he's pretty consistent with, but I think there's others he tries to involve and just say, hey, uh, at different times, you know, what do you think of this play? How did you feel about this call? How do you think this play should be ruled? And I think one of the things that they talked about with Peros is what if you to start doing the same thing? You know, what, you know, do you want to send it out to a group and say, hey, this is a play that let's, let's use, for example, Tom Wilson. Now, you're not going to send it to Brian McClellan and you're not going to send it to Brad Tree Living because his team's involved. 
but maybe send it to a bunch of other managers and say, Steve and you've actually raised, yeah, raised, ra Steve Eisman, Steve Eisman is probably a good guess. I'm betting he sees a bunch of these. <laughs> no, but, but I'm saying, like, do, do you send it to anyone for thought? I mean, if they're, if oh, they're yeah, competing that's a good for a point. playoffs, but if they're competing for a playoff, so I was like, do you think there should be a uh, penalty on Tom Wilson? <laughs> Steve Eisman of the Detroit Red Wings? Absolutely, Coley. No, you, you want to know? <laughs> you want to know something about Iserman? I, I will tell you, and I've said this on this podcast before. I think there's probably no manager who thinks uh, who thinks referees should interfere less with games than Steve Iserman. He is a big let the players decide the game mm. guy. He uh, like I think I've told this story before, but I heard if you'll remember, and I'm going off on a tangent here. If you'll remember when Nicholas Cronwall was suspended for game seven of a Detroit Tampa series, um, Iserman was the manager of Tampa at the time. So it really benefited his team if if Cronwall couldn't play. I, I, I said to someone at the league at the time, I said, oh, great, great stuff for Iserman. He must love this. And they said to me, actually, he is the one guy who wouldn't do that. He would just say, you know, whatever you guys decide, I, uh, he's generally let the players play kind of guy. Okay. So I would say if there's one guy who might not actually say 50 games for Wilson while we're racing <laughs> for the playoffs, it's probably Iserman. Anyway, um, maybe you send it to a bunch of Western Conference guys so that nobody who's in the playoffs in the East has a comment. But I do think that that's one of the things they talked about. And I also think that Peros was receptive to that. I think he also kind of challenged the managers and said hey, you know what? You guys don't really get involved with us. You know, instead of maybe, and this is my words, not from his, instead of complaining about it, how about you guys get more involved? So I think that's one of the things that I haven't written yet and I, I don't know that's been written or said yet that I think is going to come out of this meeting. I think that's going to be a big part of the future and I've got no problem with that. Um, a few other things, and they were, you know, minor tweaks that are suggested and have to go to competition committee and uh, then get royal assent after that, whether it's uh, high sticks or leg overboards or puck over glass or more video review or goalies dislodging nets. Uh, anything jump out there for you or anything that you want to sort of sharpen a point on? Something else I wanted to mention, and you point out a couple of minutes ago, you referred to the conversation we had on your radio show about how video coaches are about to become even more important, like hugely important is I had someone say to me, I wonder if teams are going to start hiring referees either as consultants or to work with their players or their coaching staff about the rule book. Hang on, because, hang on, hang on. Yes. You, know who, you know who did that in Winnipeg? Paul the Maurice. Jets did it. Yes. Paul Maurice did that. He brought NHL officials into the. Because uh, remember, the Winnipeg Jets would take like they had like season after season of undisciplined penalties, and it just killed them. And he brought NHL officials in to training camp to work with the players, which I thought was a brilliant idea and good good on Paul Maurice for doing it. I think I think the Jets have used Vaughn Rohde in the past or currently. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Face-offs, I think, is what he's he's doing uh, for the Manitoba Moose. So yes, there there is an example from what I understand. You're right, Paul Maurice did it in the past. That's a very good call, Jeff. But but this individual said to me, more teams should probably do it or think about doing it, especially as this becomes more of a thing, especially as video review expands. Like I was talking to one coach today, uh, and I said, "What do you think about it?" And he goes. Oh, I, I want more of it. I, I want more things to review. Any any chance, like there are some coaches and past coaches who think this shouldn't be up to the coaches to get right. There, It should be up to the league to say, look, we're going to get it right. The, the penalty shouldn't be on the coaches. He doesn't like that the risk is for the coaches, which is fine. But this coach said to me, I want... Give me everything I can review. Give me a smorgasbord of reviewery. And, uh, you know, I, I said to him, well, what about how long games can get? And he said, yeah, I know the league has to worry about that, but you know what I think? And I go, why? He goes, well, I'm going to be there anyway. So it's not like I'm going anywhere. So just give me more things to review. <laughs> he said he wants to review as many things as he can to review. Oh, 
slow the game down to a crawl. It's bad enough the coaches have destroyed overtime and we'll get there. Now they want more and more video review and slowing the game down. And after every whistle, everybody gets the iPad. The NHL, I'm here, so you're going to be here too. What a slogan. That's a great one. That's a whole new campaign for next season. Okay, well done, Elliot. Our work here is done. Lunch, gentlemen. Uh, okay, well done, um, Elliot. Well, let, let me let me ask you about a drill down on video coaches, just to, to put a, a final bow around this thing. Um, are we on the precipice now of video coaches really getting paid? And are we on the precipice now of there being like a real competition amongst teams to get the best possible video coaches working for them like i i threw out that tongue-in-cheek quote off the top about you know uh you know john tortorella i <laughs> said benching or, or scratching a video coach who, who misses a play but like these play, these people are going to be more valuable than ever before you've pointed that out here and elsewhere um i would have to imagine that compensation would rise commensurate with how important they're going to be and i can't help but thinking much like we see in the battle for every team's analytics department, the competition to put together a great staff, a great video staff is going to be huge, Elliot. Well, first of all, I like to see people get paid, so I hope so. But I, you said the word there, staff. You know, for example, the Maple Leafs have two video coaches who've made some huge calls for them this year. In addition to getting paid... Again, I'd like to see everybody get paid. I just wonder more and more they're gonna they're gonna be hired. You know, for example, one of the things that's gonna happen here is that the more that is video reviewable, Jeff, the more these coaches are gonna have to look at at the same time. So as good as some of these coaches are, one of them can't do it all. Yep. So you're probably gonna need two or three people. And Jeff, we talk about these franchise altering decisions big money decisions under pressure, critical moments for the video coaches. Look at Vegas, Seattle on Thursday night. Vegas is up almost the entire game. They're up one nothing with six and a half minutes to go. Jaden Schwartz ties it. And then Keegan Kolasar puts in what looks like the winning goal with a minute 20 to go, and it's close. Like, offside challenge, that's a close, close challenge. So what do they do? They decide to challenge it, and I would have done it in the same situation. It goes Vegas' way, the goal counts. Now you're down 2-1 with a minute 20 to go, and you're shorthanded. Vegas scores uh, with the empty net. That's how pressure cooked these decisions are as Seattle's trying to win and Vegas is trying to hold on to the playoffs with the Blues chasing them. Like these jobs, they are not, not for the weak hearted. This is, and I was making this point on the radio on Thursday. If you're someone who's aged out of actually playing hockey or maybe injured yourself, or just your your on ice career is over, but you want to stay in the game. There's a lot of different avenues you can go down. There's yeah. broad, there's broadcasting, there's coaching. No, don't do that. Don't. Uh, no, we, we have enough broadcasters. <laughs> don't don't do that. Okay, scrub that one. Um, but but also like stay out of, stay out of my lane. Stay out of my lane. <laughs> yeah, get get uh, stay stay behind the scenes and you know call offsides for teams here. But no, that's going to be like a a really big field. And if you're someone that's you know, considering a position in the game, like if you've played hockey your whole life, like there's a lot of knowledge of the game, obviously you understand it. And if you want to marry that with a love of, you know, staying in the game and, you know, working for a team and having the the winning, losing juices pumping through your veins, video coaching could be it because yeah, why not? as much, hey, listen, as you made this point on, on Thursday and I thought a lot about it since you said it and it's true as much as, you know, coaches go through the emotional roller coaster. And as much as coaches are the ones feeling a ton of stress, how'd you like to be the video coach that makes a call on a Stanley Cup winning goal? You want to talk about stress level? You want to talk about pressure? You want to talk about, you know, being nervous and having to make that call when what's on the line here are millions and millions of dollars and it's up to you. It's, it's a it, it, honestly it, in hockey, this could be Elliot, a fascinating field 
to be involved yep. in. It really, really could be. You know, um, some is you know, and the other thing too is some people they're adrenaline junkies, right? Like some people are not cut out for that. You know, and I understand it. Not not everybody is capable of that kind of split second decision was so much on the line you're not just you know it, it's not only the money at stake but it's your team depending on you to make that call in the moment and for to be honest video coaches have been doing that for a while now and even the the video reviewers i think you have to say have been doing it for a while now but if you want to be if you're not a pro athlete but you want to be in the thick of the moment and making a decision that can be the difference between uh, the the glory of victory and the agony of defeat. That position is only growing more in importance. Uh, real quick, uh, no changes to overtime. This one, upon much further reflection, doesn't surprise me at all. As much as we, we grouse about neutral zone regroups, I, I said my piece to you on the radio, I see that as a symptom of something else. Um, nothing is going to be done about it. Your thoughts on that one? Well, it, it just goes to, even though this one coach, his new slogan is, I'm going to be there, so you're going to be there with me too. <laughs> I, I, I think the NHL looks at it as, we are not lengthening these games any more than we have to. We are not adding any more whistles than we have to, unless you give us a good reason. And, and I think one of the things here is that, Nobody has shown them anything that would make overtime better that wouldn't make it longer. And, you know, the ECHL, they looked at the seven-minute ECHL overtime. That's a bargaining issue. Uh, yes. I don't know where that would go, but it's not just happening out of nowhere. And, and I think there is a feeling, even though players are more careful and they aren't shooting generally as randomly as they used to, even with the regroups, the, the, the chances come back in most cases. So I think barring a better idea, this, the, the idea of any of this change, changing lost steam. Uh, I, I really believe it did. So, you know, it's funny, Jeff, th this is one of the things I wanted to talk to you about. We had, I don't know, was it five to seven rule recommendations that still have to go to the competition committee and the board of governors. And, you know, these were the most since 0405 when they had the lockout year and, and really Colin Campbell and Brendan Shanahan at all kind of redid the game. And there were some people who said to me after the meetings were over that um, there are there are those in the NHL that don't like it when there are this many changes because it creates the impression there's there's something wrong with the game, right? And... And I, I, in this case, I don't agree. I, I think if you were making major changes, you would look at it and say, we've got a problem. But to me, these are a lot of minor tweaks, not a big deal, and nothing that says the quality of the game is poor. So, you know, I was interested in that. Somebody mentioned that to me. And I was like, really? Wow. Like, I don't, I don't see it that way at all. Um, but it just shows you, like, people are sensitive to that kind of thinking and, I don't look at this as in any way, shape, or form saying that the quality of the game is not good. I think it's simply, are there things we can do that are not major but can make the game even better? I saw it that way. Two things for me on that point. Number one, let's all say it together. Tradition is peer pressure from dead people. <laughs> If you don't evolve and continue to evolve, your game will stagnate and die. I know we all like to talk about, oh, the tradition, and this is passed on, and this is tradition that's gone back 100 years. Blah, 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 blah. Tradition is peer pressure from dead people. I think it's your responsibility as a sport, whether you're hockey, whether you're baseball, whether you're football, basketball, whatever, to constantly review your sport to make sure that you are reflecting the modern tastes of the modern sports fan. Sports fans' tastes are always changing, and I think it's the smart sports, the wise sports, that reflect those tastes. Otherwise, they will vanish. So I don't mind this at all. Like, I, to be honest with you, I worry when there's a period of, you know, five or six years 
when nothing changes. Even if it's a small thing. I, I'm with even, you on even, that. Even, you should, even you just, should even, always be trying yes. to do a little something. Yes. Yes. Something. I, just I completely... I completely agree with that. I'm continue. with you on this one. Continue. Normally your ideas are terrible. This one's good. <laughs> you just like tradition is peer pressure from dead people. I know. A That's party a great, like, that, that yeah, is a ooh, great like line. That. That's a like really that good line. I do okay. like that. Okay. Um, from there, let's go to some of the games that we saw on Thursday. Now, Elliot, earlier on this week, there was sort of an awkward moment between you and me. I don't even know if you realized that it happened. What's but that? I can't remember. It's like a Tuesday or a Wednesday on the radio show. And I asked you something about the New York Islanders. And you said, I don't know what to say at this point. I can't yes. give you an answer. And I'm like, you know what? He's right, man. We've been banging this one for so long now. Uh, I shouldn't have even brought it up. And it kind of made for like, I don't know, uh, six or 45 seconds of awkwardness on the radio. But nonetheless, here we are now. Is there still... Still nothing to say about the Islanders after getting doubled up by the Red Wings, who now have 78 points. And welcome back, Dylan Larkin, with a pair of goals and its six losses in a row for the Islanders. And Patrick Waugh pulled his goaltender with 535 remaining in the third period because he's Patrick Waugh. And the song remained the same for the Islanders. Bill Parcells, who's a New York legend, you are what your record says you are. And to me, this is, it's, it's really stunning. It's been stunning to watch. Um, they're officially now in the math is, is not their friend territory for a couple of reasons. They're at 73 points. They're five behind Detroit. They're six behind Philadelphia. Uh, yes, they have a game in hand on both those teams. But the other reason things are really bad for them is they have the fewest regulation wins, of the, uh, which is the first tiebreaker of any of these teams around there. And by a significant margin, they're 21, and you have, you have talked about their record. But the thing that really stands out is, is just the way they've gone down. Like, you know, that Islander identity for a, a long time was, was, was pure heart, right? They were the grind team of, of the NHL, and, and they were the team that grinded their way to victory in a lot of ways. And uh, Lou Lamorello is one of the toughest people in the league, and Patrick Waugh is one of the toughest players ever to play. And, uh, you know, stunningly, at the hardest part of the season, it, the, the team just has fallen apart. And I, I find it shocking. Um, you know, there are some Islander fans online. I don't know why, but my timeline, that For You tab lately, like Elon is clearly <laughs> listening to me because that For You tab is full of Islander fans saying, I told you this team was not very good. And, and sometimes that's just fatalism. You know, the, yeah. the, the fans are fans and, and they're a reason they're, we're all employed. And I appreciate them for that. But fans are generally a, a group of, hey, we're allowed to say our team is crap. But if you say our team is crap, we're going to oh, kill yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, you know, the, that, that's, that's fans. <laughs> but, you know, they would say that they saw this coming. I have to admit, I, I did not. Look, I, I knew they could miss the playoffs. I did not see it ending like this. I, I, I did not see it ending like this. And, and Patrick Waugh... You can see he's just at a loss for words. We talked about this on the last pod, that one thing that Patrick Wad could not understand is how in a big game you couldn't be ready to be at your best. And, you know, one of the things, my, my favorite memories about Wah was his last Stanley Cup win was in 2001. That was the avalanche over the Devils in seven games. Game four, Colorado was up in that series two games to one. And they were winning 2-1 at the time and had a chance to go up three games to one. And in the third period, he fumbled the puck behind the net. He was trying to puck handle it. And it led to a goal by Scott Gomez. And then Peter Sikora scored late in regulation and it tied the series at two. And, you know, people who knew why and the Avalanche said, because that was the big storyline. I remember, Wah fumbles game. Wah fumbles game. Devils tie the series. 
And I remember the people who really knew Juan, the Avalanche, were all like, big deal. Um, you know, he's going to make up for it. And actually, the Devils won game five, four to one in Colorado and had a chance to win the series at home. Well, Wash shut them out in game six and Colorado won game seven, uh, three to one. And Wah was particularly brilliant early in game six. And so, you know, one of the things they talked about after that was, first of all, it was a big game, so you knew Wah was going to be great. And secondly, because he'd made a mistake, you knew eventually he was going to take over the series. And the Colorado players talked about that. And so, like, that's that's Wah, right? Like, that's, that's one of the reasons we all loved him was so... I think he's got to be looking at this and just completely at a loss. I'm sure the Islanders organization is is completely at a loss. And, you know, if they don't write themselves, you know, they've got a lot of players signed there to big contracts, but they do, you know, they do have some that are coming towards the end. You know, people are going to look at this and they're going to say, okay, could this be a bit of a changing of the guard in New York. Will the Islanders look at this hard and say, we are going to have to make changes because you know someone like Lamorello and you know someone like Patrick Waugh are going to look at this and say, we can't come back with the same group the way this year has ended. Because if there's one thing, and I would bet you even the players there are the same, you know, when you, it's one thing to lose at the end of the year. It's one thing to go through a stretch like this. And unless they really write themselves, these are the kinds of endings to the season that bring change to your organization. Um, I had Ken Daniels, play-by-play voice of the Detroit Red Wings on the radio show on Thursday. And he gave me a money quote before this game. Um, He's he been said, on fire lately, Ken. Oh, Ken's been awesome. He I mean, he always is, but you're, you're right. He's really been on fire lately. That call, by the way, in that Columbus game with the Showtime goal, like with all due respect, Pat Foley called some great ones, but man, Ken Daniels calling big moments by Patrick Kane. Holy smoke, sign me up. Okay, this is from Ken Daniels. Quote, this is about the Islanders game um, at Little Caesars. This is likely the biggest hockey game with as much meaning ever played outside of an opener at Little Caesars Arena. Mm -hmm. It had that feel. Like this was must win for the Detroit Red Wings. They needed to create distance. Dylan Larkin was coming back. Um, They could, you know, put a nail into the coffin for the Islanders, uh, a team that's, you know, right there with a win. They would get a tight turtleneck uh, around the Detroit Red Wings' throats. Um, I think Dan, I I think Kenny was right. Outside of an opener, that was the biggest Detroit Red Wings game so far at Little Caesars Arena when you factor in everything that was on the line. Now, if the Detroit Red Wings make the playoffs, all of that gets eclipsed. But leading into Thursday's game, this was the biggest hockey game by the Detroit Red Wings at that rink since it's opened. You know, there are going to be people who are going to be very happy to see the Red Wings in the playoffs should they make it, and not just the Red Wings fans. So, you know, our whole thing about expanding the playoffs... And we talked on Monday about how people said to me, the way the East is going, they should not expand the playoffs. There are too many garbage teams. <laughs> I had somebody who said to me at the GM meetings, do not give this up, even though Bettman hates it, because it's just bad that teams like Detroit and Buffalo have not been in the playoffs for so long. It just It's bad for the markets, it's bad for the league, and it really damages their organizations in their city. So, and the other thing, too, is Detroit, that is a big revenue arena. It does not oh. hurt <laughs> if, yeah. that rev, if that arena yeah. is collecting playoff revenues. Uh, HRR, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you're a player who's not in the playoffs, you cheer for the biggest market teams that can put the most money into the coffers. Boy, and, and we should that. mention Larkin coming back tonight and what yeah, a big— two goals. Two what goals. a big Look factor great. he was. What a big factor. You know factor. what? Simon Edvinson as well. You know, Steve Eisman talked about, well, prices are too 
um, too expensive at deadline. Actually, this was a clash of two teams that were silent at deadline, uh, the Islanders and the Detroit Red Wings. But Simon Edvinson gets the call up, and he looked fantastic on Thursday night. He was on that on that first Larkin goal. He was tremendous. Um, I mean, great wingspan, the size, keeping the puck hot. He was. He had a fantastic game on Thursday. Okay, you mentioned two friend of the pod Ryan Hanna feeling yes. vindicated for all of his Simon <laughs> Edvinson love. Yeah, yeah. Give me Edvinson. He proved it, man. He looked great. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah. you mentioned two thousand one a couple of seconds ago. I want to rewind to two thousand one um, okay. on a on a different note. In two thousand one, in Tampa, John Tortorella was the head coach. Vincent LeCavalier was yeah. the star player, and Rick Dudley was the general manager. Yeah, Things were not going, I'm going to give this a soft landing, swimmingly between Vincent LeCavalier and John Tortorella, to the point where um, the Tampa Bay Lightning had a deal worked out with the Toronto Maple Leafs to trade Vincent LeCavalier to yes. Toronto. Now, my former partner on Leafs Lunch uh, many years ago, Bill Waters, uh, told me the specifics on that deal because the Maple Leafs wanted to run a 1-2 up the middle of Matt Sundin and Vincent LeCavalier. Um, the specifics of the deal were Vinny LeCavalier in exchange for Nick Antropoff, Jonas Hoagland, Thomas Caberle, and Tampa's Choice, either a first-round pick or Brad Boys. Their decision. That was the deal. Everybody went to bed on it, thinking it was going to get done, but it didn't get done the next morning. Um, shortly after, I want to say like a month or a month and a half, Rick Dudley resigned as the general yes. manager, and in came Jay Feaster. And quite famously in Tampa, Jay Feaster went to both John Tortorella and Vincent LeCavalier and said, Vinny, I'm not firing John, and John... I'm not trading Vinny. You two need to figure this thing out right now because neither of you are going anywhere. Now, that's an extreme example from John Tortorella's past, but it is part of it. How do you see the situation with John Tortorella and Sean Couturier right now? First of all, listening to that, you also remember that Vincent LeCavalier was nearly traded from Tampa to Montreal. There is a oh, great yes. story to be done one day on all of the Vincent LeCavalier trades that didn't happen, that nearly yes. happened. Absolutely. But your, you know, your story is obviously right. You had a great source on that, so your your story is is obviously correct. Um, you know, this isn't exactly the same. Um, you know, at the time, Vincent LeCavalier was, was what, two years into his NHL career, and there were a lot of years to come. This is later. I'm just trying um, to, Elliot, I'm just trying to capture the spirit of the thing. Yeah, so, yeah, it's, yeah it's, I it's, understand. It's a, week for, it's, a week for, it's a week for that line, sorry. And, and the one thing I, I do agree with is, you know, Daniel Briere is going to have a role he's going to have to play here. And, and, and that is uh, brokering, I don't know, whatever it is, a piece, a detente, whatever you want to call it, between John Tortorella and his captain. Um, you know, I, I have to say, Jeff, that this happening a month after uh, Couturier was named captain has spawned a lot of conspiracy theories about what everybody thought of the captaincy being named in the first place. You can only imagine all of the conspiracy theories being thrown around this one. You know, th there's a lot here that's, you know, again, I I've said this on your show and I wrote it. Nobody can be surprised at this. This is page one of the Tortorella playbook. There are no sacred cows. And if you can't do what I need you to do, or I feel you're not giving me the effort, and number one, there's no way that he's got a problem with Couturier's effort. As I, you know, I, I do feel, as I've said, this is a pace issue. John, but John Tortorella, if he's not happy with your play or you can't give him what he wants, he's going to take you out of the lineup. It's happened to kids. It's happened to veterans. Um, it's happened to everybody in a year where John Tortorella could be coach of the year. Philly, like nobody thought Philly was going to be here. Nobody. 
And he's had a great year. He's pushed almost all the right buttons. To me, this shows Couturier's popularity because there are a lot of other players that this could happen to and nobody would say anything or nobody would fight like this. But it shows how popular a guy Couturier is, how much he's beloved, how much that he is respected for returning to play when it would have been very easy for him to retire and take the money, right? There are people looking at him, and, and and I actually do think that that has been one of the things that's been raised in defense of Couturier, that you, you can't do this to him because of all of the effort he put into even playing. Like, he didn't quit. He continued to play. And I, and I wouldn't be surprised if Tortorella's argued, well, I've already given him benefit and grace for that, but it's time. So... You know, the, the I wondered if he might get back in on Thursday. I was live into your radio show on Thursday and we were talking about it. And someone uh, texted me who knows Tortorella and said, you know, be careful until warm up. You never knew if, if know if Tortorella is throwing the media a fake. Like he has Couturier skating on the fifth line and then he shows up and he plays tonight. But obviously that didn't happen. And that guy texted me and said, wow, he actually went through with it. I didn't know that he was going to actually go through with it. And, you know, they lost and, and, and though they played hard and, and we'll see what this is going to mean for Saturday night. But, you, you know, the there's two things about it I think are weird. Number one, Jeff, I, I think it's weird that Couture didn't seem to know why he was getting benched because that's the thing about Tortorella. You know, BX and everybody who's played for him will say, we always know where we stand. We always know where we stand. And for someone to say, I don't know where I stand, that's weird to hear for, for me from him because that's usually not the issue. And the final thing I would say is Tortorella not showing up after the game on Thursday to meet with the media and Brad Shaw doing it. Now, one thing I do like is that the Flyers give Brad Shaw and Rocky Thompson visibility. That's going to help those guys' careers. They periodically do it from time to time, and, and those guys get FaceTime. But especially after a loss, like these are situations where Tortorella knows he's the guy everyone wants to hear from. And especially after a loss... Uh, to not hear from him. I always give the benefit of the doubt in the, in the sense that this should always be a qualifier in the sense that maybe something has happened where he can't talk. Because if that turns out to be the case, I'm going to feel really stupid. But Jeff, it's weird that after that game, Tortorella's not talking. And especially after some people have been saying, and I actually thought about it on Tuesday morning, I thought, I thought he should have been face front after it was clear Couturier wasn't playing. You know, you just, you look at it and say, this is weird. It's just weird. Does it not feel to you, and again, I'm basing this on nothing other than, like, I think we're all looking at this and wondering, you know, the reason for this. And I know Tortorella keeps coming back to either, I'm not going to talk about Sean or... I'm trying to put together the best possible lineup for two points. Like yeah, it's, you, it's, you know what? But even but, if but, you're but, saying but, that, you have the, to go out there and do that. If that's the reason, here, that's not a good enough here, reason to say no. Let me let me let me let me let me push this a little bit. Here's okay. what I wonder about. I wonder if John Tortorella is trying really hard not to tell us something. That there's something that he might want to say. Or they, obviously there is some type of reason here. There is some type of issue here. And he knows he's going to continue to get asked about it. And maybe for the benefit of the Philadelphia Flyers, he realizes no good will come of it if I explain myself. Well, that that's what happened on Tuesday, right? He said, I'm not talking about Sean. 
I'm not talking about it. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think, your I th- point, I think in you're his, probably in his mind, you're probably a hundred percent right. I I would concede this to you without even arguing. Yes, that is his way of saying I'm not going where you want me to go because I don't think it would be good. You, Jeff, it doesn't, I, I it think doesn't you're benefit the hundred percent right. Yes. I think you're a hundred percent right on that. Now, you know, I'll, I'll say this. I'll, I'll say this too. There's a couple other things here. Let's go conspiracy wild here, okay? Oh, oh. Okay. So, number one, uh, like uh, in the aftermath of this, I have heard a ton of conspiracy theories, and I want to say, I just, you know, I don't know how many of them are right. You know, this is a podcast. We throw stuff out there like spaghetti against a wall, and and see what sticks. <laughs> Number one, one of the things, and I could see this potentially being true, is that maybe Tortorella's unhappy that Couturier's agent talked. And number one, as a reporter, I'm not going to complain about that because I'd be making that call too. And number two, it's Couturier's agent, and that's his job to protect his client. But... You know, I did have people suggest to me that, you know, if here, here's the thing, like Katrina is the captain, right? So it's always an even higher level of craziness when it involves the captain. And, you know, some people will look at it and say, well, that you even have to take more of kid gloves. Well, people will look at it the other way and say it's the captain. They have to make sure they do less to create controversy, Right. And, and I said, everybody's entitled to one day where they can be upset. And Couturier had it. But I did have people say to me that Tortorella might look at it as, you're the captain, it's your job not to create controversy, and your agent spoke. Now, not everybody is going to see that the same way. And again, if I'm a reporter, actually, I kind of am, I'm making that call too. But Someone said to me, look at it from Tortorella's point of view. And the other thing, and I'll, and I'll say this, uh, there, there's the, the other conspiracy theory out here is how much longer is Tortorella going to coach? And could Brad Shaw or Rocky Thompson be the next coach of the Philadelphia Flyers? And is Tortorella simply saying, I'm happy to give these guys more time? Hmm. I'm, I'm not sure so that sure one will go will go I'm not, nowhere. I'm not, I, I, I'm not so sure about that last one. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, like I said, it's weird. Like the the fact that you know Tortorella uh, didn't didn't speak. Like unless there's a good explanation, it's especially after a loss. Like I, I'm surprised. I, I am surprised. You, you know, as pissed off as I would be at some things sometimes if I was coaching after a loss. Hey, I'm the boss. I'm the number one guy. I'm getting paid the big bucks. I'm I'm going out there to answer for it. You'd have to have a really good reason for me not to. And maybe there is one. You'd have to have yeah. a really good reason for me not to go out there. Okay. Uh, a couple of more things here before we get to the Montana's thought line. Uh, yeah. I want to mention the Nashville Predators and their 16-game point streak. Um, they beat the Florida Panthers by a final score of 3-0. Uh, Jason Zucker and Nick Cousins, by the way, um, had their scrap, so Zucker got his retribution on, uh, yep. on Nick Cousins, um, and I will applaud Nick Cousins for obliging. Like yep. they lined up at the draw, and they they both went and knuckled up, and that's great. Uh, Kevin Lankin Nick Cousins has really taken saves. it this year, and oh yeah, and it's not like the thing about this is it's not media; it's his peers. Yes, that's yes. different. I mean. You, well, you see, you see players from other teams laying into them a little bit extra, and, and former making players sure, and making sure they finish checks on Nick Cousins, even if it's like a midweek game and a quote unquote you know small market or something like that. Guys are gunning for him. Yeah, like there was a game not too long ago. It was uh, Edmonton in Florida? How many times did Evander Kane go right at him hard? hard on Nick Cousins, real tough. And I, I think that's part of like how a lot of the, the peer, his, his peers feel in the NHL about how he's, you know, uh, what he's done with people who they consider to be in vulnerable positions. That is their way of, of, of policing the game. Uh, Lincoln in with 33 saves, uh, picks up the shutout. Uh, Philip Forsberg, Mr. Consistency, two goals, one assist. 
good on the Preds. I got to say, like we talk about teams grabbing a spot and taking the two points and, you know, grabbing their 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 wild card spot and running away and hiding. Nashville's doing it. 16 game point streak. So, you know what someone said to me on uh, on Thursday? When are you going to start the talking Philip about Roman, Yos- Roman Yossi oh, for our yeah. trophy? Yeah. So stop no, with the know. Norris. He's been, yeah, he's been excellent. So he said, "Stop with the Norris. The Norris isn't going to be, isn't going to be good enough." Yossi had another assist. He's got fifty-three assists this year. You know, he's got, he's got seventy-one points. He's a point per game guy. Seventy-one yeah. points in seventy games, and he started slow. Yep. No, it's, it's the guy said to me the Norris he, Trophy is not good enough for Roman Yossi. <laughs> well, as the Pittsburgh Penguins fall out of this thing, and we wonder if Sidney Crosby goes with them on the uh, the Hart Trophy race, uh, maybe enter Roman Yossi in, into that discussion. But it's true, like even if you don't watch Nashville on a consistent basis, but maybe you just sort of you know read read the game sheet and, uh, uh, every morning just to to catch up on who's doing what. Like you pick it up, and like every game, it's like. Roman Yossi, one goal, three assists. Roman Yossi, yeah. three assists. Roman Yossi, like uh, two goals and one assist. Like it's just like I, I mentioned Philip Forsberg's Mr. Consistency, but so is Roman Yossi. Yeah. Every single, every game, Elliot. I'm glad you mentioned him because you're right. Every single game, he's he's right in there. Okay. It was not uh, his agent who called. I know people are going to ask that. <laughs> you know what I'm wondering about on Saturday night? You want to hear something that? that would be pretty crazy on Saturday night? Okay. Zach Hyman's at 48 goals. Where does Edmonton play on Saturday? Uh, the um, the People's Republic of the Toronto Maple Leafs. <laughs> Imagine if Zach Hyman hits 50 in Toronto. No, I know. The place will melt. Absolutely. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but I think, yeah, hang on. But the, Okay, let me ask you this. It's I pretty think crazy. Fan, I, I, I think, hang on. I think Leafs fans would love it. Uh, I don't know if they would love it. He would get a great ovation there. I, I, I do believe that, but I don't know if love it would be the exact response. Put it put it this way. He gets, a, the, so the perfect thing for the for a Maple Leafs fan on Saturday, Hockey Night in Canada, Edmonton's in Toronto to face off against the Maple Leafs. It's a 5-4 Maple Leafs victory. Hyman scores two for the Oilers uh, to give him 50 goals in a, in a losing cause. So Maple Leafs fans can get their two points and also see Zach Hyman get fifty, because I think he's still loved. I really do. I, I do. Like, like I said, I think he would get an ovation. Uh, but the electricity coming from that building, if Hyman scored his fiftieth on Saturday night, and the electricity going from the social media fiasco that would enrage uh, that would enrage everyone online could power about 10,000 <laughs> Neuralinks. I, I really believe would be quite, I mean, okay. it's incredible. Hyman at 48 goals and, yeah, and McDavid he's, he's awesome. is closing in on a hundred assists to become the fourth guy ever to do it. But Hyman 50 in, in Toronto, I kind of want to see it on Saturday night. I, I really love I'd really love to see it happen. And, you know, St. Louis, you know, Vegas won two. They held on against Seattle. I know what I'm doing here. Vegas won two. They held on against Seattle. But St. Louis went into Ottawa and won. You know, Vegas still has a game in hand. Um, but I, I'm glad St. Louis is at least trying to make this a race. You know, Nashville mm. has put themselves in excellent math spot. I think we're all kind of surprised that Vegas is right here and it looks like Hurdle's getting close to skating here. So we'll see what his timetable is. But I want races and the Blues Mm. at the very least are making this one a race. You know, Minnesota had an ugly game uh, this week. The 6-0 loss to... LA, the six nothing oh loss to LA. Brodeen's hurt. Erickson Eck is hurt. It's not looking good for them. If anyone's going to give us a race in the West, it looks like it's the Blues, and they they yeah. did their part on on Thursday night. All you can do is create pressure. And you know what? I actually speaking of LA, there was a there was a great tweet I saw. I wanted to recognize, 
and it was a tweet from uh, Daddy Kopitar on X. And, you know, he pointed out... Daddy Kopitar? Yes. Now, I assume this is a person because their name is Daddy Kopitar. So I'm going with... I'm assuming this is a he. A he. Daddy Daddy Kopitar, if that is indeed your real name. (laughs) So he tweets... Anza Kopitar is about to break into the top 50 all-time points leaders, never had a points-per-game teammate in his career. Two Stanley Cups, two Lady Bings, Mm. two Selkie trophies, MVP finalists. This week, he got the second game misconduct of his career. And he goes, he's arguably the greatest two-way forward of all time. That's, that's, That's pretty impressive stuff. Really impressive stuff. And, uh, you know, the Kings are a weird team. Like, there's there's games I watch them and, like, oh, these guys are going to be a, a a real tough handle for someone. There's games I watch them and I'm like, what am I watching here? These guys have forgotten <laughs> how to play hockey. But, you know, right now it looks like it's Kings-Oilers first round for the third year in a row. And I, yep. I don't know what Kings team we're going to get here yet. But, boy, Kopitar just... Consistence, consistency, consistency for 20 years. Guy deserves the recognition. Best LA King of all time? I I think you'd have to say yes. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I really do. At a time where another former King, Jonathan Quick, tied the record for most wins by a U.S. Mm. born goaltender by beating the Bruins. I, I think you'd, you'd have to say yes. I don't know who you would have put there before. Wayne Gretzky, even though he wasn't there for a long time. Luke Marcel Robitaille, Dion. Marcel Dion, Marcel Dave Taylor, Dion. Rogie Vachon, Rob oh, Blake. My heart. My Rob heart, Blake. My heart. Rogi, I think Rogi, you have to Rogi. say it's it's Kopitar. Yeah, uh, it is. And you uh, know what? If I was is- Kopitar, if I was Kopitar, I would say my statue has at least needs to be at least one inch bigger than Dustin Brown's statue. I would I would do that <laughs> just to be that petty. Okay, very just good. to be that. Petty. Um, let me circle back on one thing you mentioned the St. Louis Blues a couple of seconds ago. Uh, congratulations to Zach Dean, who made his uh, NHL debut with the St. Louis Blues, a former first round draft pick of the Vegas Golden Knights, uh, was the piece that St. Louis got in the Ivan Barbashev deal. Uh, former gold medalist for Team Canada World Juniors, uh, played his minor hockey in Newfoundland, born in Alberta. Family moved to Newfoundland. He played in Gatineau right across the way from Ottawa. Uh, so a real special moment there in his first game, I would imagine. There would have been plenty of friends and family. And as you like to say, Elliot, when there's that many in the stands, you are playing for... Free. Free. Congratulations on your first NHL game. You're playing for free. Congratulations, Zach Dean there. Um, quick thought on Tom Wilson in person hearing Whoa, the, uh, the yes. high stick on Noah Gregor. Have a, a thought on this one. It was, it was a bizarre scene because it even seemed to surprise Tom Wilson that he did that. Like the minute it happened, like Wilson grabs Noah Gregor as if to say, I didn't really know what happened there. Like it looked like he was trying again this is going to sound weird he was trying to swing his stick at him but didn't think he was going to catch him in the face you know what i mean like i think it even surprised tom wilson yeah but still to me what it says is that this is a they're looking at like this is a really tough one for washington you you cannot afford to lose him but you know you're you're going to right so but they're they're simply going to say, you know, he's got a history and he has to control his stick better than this. Like he just has to do a, a, a better job. And now we have seen this year, we've seen big suspensions to players who weren't injured. Perron, six games, Riley, five games. Like it used to be to get this kind of suspension. Injuries had to be involved. Now we're yeah. not there anymore. Perron and Riley had no history, right? Wilson obviously does. Like when I saw he got offered an in-person hearing, I said to someone, are we talking Ooh. like 15, 20 games here? And I don't mm. think we are. I, I, I think we're looking, my guess based on, and, and I don't want anyone reporting saying he's getting this, but my guess based on everything I heard today is that we're probably looking at six to 10 games. Like I don't think we're looking at 15 to 20. But it, it's it's amazing how in a short time things have really changed in the sense that 
we've gone from no history means you get something lighter to that doesn't matter and no injury meaning maybe you get something lighter to that doesn't matter because thankfully Gregor's okay here this is a player with a history and you know I think he's getting something I would guess between six to ten but that's Mm -hmm. a massive loss for Washington considering uh, you know they're in the race they've only got uh, 14 games left and now you're 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 worried about losing and you've got two games in hand on Detroit you've got two games in hand on Philadelphia you're already a team that has to fight and scratch and claw for everything you get and one of those players who's so critical to your team you might lose them for half those games uh you're right about all of it and one other thing that I'll throw one other log I'll throw on the fire here um, when you look at the Washington Capitals and the strength of schedule, the teams they are playing against, yeah. it's one of the worst possible schedules to have. Like at last yeah. check, I think it was like the fourth worst schedule for any team to have. Like everyone around them, like everyone around them on this uh, final stretch, these 14 games are winning teams pretty much. This is a tough one. This is a real tough one for the Capitals and they're going to have to do it without Tom Wilson, as you point out, for a sizable amount of time. Now, before we wrap up, Jeff, actually, somebody, so someone sent me a note tonight while we were recording okay. the pod about something that we had discussed in a previous podcast. And oh. that is that during the Seattle-Vegas game, Jared McCann tries to score off of Logan Thompson's mask. And they Mm. said, this is something that you have talked about. And I I said to them, and and this is an executive in the league who would have some juice. Uh, He sent us the note. My first response was, why are you listening to anything I say? My second response was... (laughs) Uh, you know, and so I, I thanked them for sending me the note. And, you know, I did ask a couple of managers about this and, and just said, you know, what do you guys think? And you know what the response to me was? It said, this one's going to be on the goalies. And I said, why do you think that? And he said, because if a player is shooting where he can score, like if the goalie was standing with his head over, over the net and players were shooting at their mask, then you'd go to the players and you'd say, Hey, you you can't do that. We we're going to stop that. Mm -hmm. But if the goalie's mask is in a place where the player can score, you can't tell the players not to shoot there. Yep. I agree completely. I a hundred percent. That's why like, I know there is a sensitivity obviously around directing you know fists or sticks or in this case pucks at someone's head but if the goaltender is going to choose to seal up a corner with his head and only leave a little bit of space players now have the skill to bank it off their heads i'm the same way like if it's above the crossbar or if it's like like we all remember the wendell clark curtis joseph you know it's a blowout game and he comes down blasts one off curtis joseph face it's like oh okay like i, I always look back at that one Elliot. it's funny too i look back at that one and think wow if twitter was around then uh how much would hockey twitter have melted uh during that scene with all that with all the takes but as long as net minders and so far like the other thing that i'll say is so far we haven't heard goalies complain about it we haven't no. had either an injury nor have we had a goalie complain about it yet. Do things change if there is an injury or if a goalie complains about it? Maybe, probably, at least there's a conversation. At least maybe it becomes uh, an agenda item at the general manager's meetings. I, I'm not sure. But as of right now, the only people that seem to be talking about it are podcasts or radio shows or intermissions on on various games. But I do wonder if there's going to be a goalie somewhere down the road and says, hold on a second here. What about my head? Why don't you protect mine here? And I think the right point is, well, don't stick it in places where players are trying to shoot. Right? I 100% agree. Okay. Uh, On that, we will pause. Uh, When we return, we try the ribs. Montana's thought line in moments. 
Listen to the 32 Thoughts podcast ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Okay, Elliot, time now once again for the Montana's Thought Line, Montana's Barbecue and Bar, Canada's home for barbecue, Elliot. It's fantastic. And if somebody goes to that much of an effort to do this, we're using it. That is the new try the ribs for the next little while until yes. my mercurial mind decides oh my something else. So again, that is uh, Rick Turner from last week with his hit new single, Try the Ribs. Uh, he sent something along to the thought line, by the way, at 32 thoughts at sportsnet.ca. Uh, hey guys, heard the jingle on the pod. Thanks for the kind words. Wanted to follow up and say, I'm from Perth, Ontario, a buddy from Brockville, Ontario, Leo Diesenthuber, help with the music production. So Leo, thank you. Rick, thank you as always for the Try the Ribs jingle. 32 thoughts at sportsnet.ca, one 311 With that, let's jump right in. And let's go to Scotland. Hold on, before we before we do that. Okay, I oh, have, wait a minute. Yes, oh, you yes, have some I have updates. Four yes. updates, four. Okay, oh, geez. Okay, four, four updates. Okay, so, I, can, you hang know on. what? Can, can you tell Elliot had some time at the airport this week? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I got to give credit to people, some of them who work in the NHL, some of them uh, regular fans and listeners who hear things and they say, well, what about this or know this? So here, first of all, one is Ken Daniels, who you had on your radio show. He was great. On, on, on Thursday. And he's talked about Stephen Halko, players who had no goals and a ton of shots. And he pointed out that in the last game at Joe Lewis Arena for the Red Wings, Riley Sheehan came into that game mm. with no goals on 106 shots that season yep. and scored twice, including yep. the final goal ever scored at that arena. By the way, another broadcaster pointed out that Halko's defense partner that year was one Paul of the Coffey. greatest defensemen in NHL history. Paul Coffey. <laughs> Paul Coffey. So it's all Coffey's fault. Okay. Yeah, Second, yeah. Yes. an unnamed NHL executive hearing the conversation about longest name on the back of a jersey mentioned Jacob Forsbaka Carlson. And he said, Jeff, that does not qualify under your hyphenated names because Forsbaka Carlson did not hyphenate Hyphenate. those two names. Yes, Uh, that's true. And one of the reasons why I loved Jacob Forsbaka Carlson playing with the Boston Bruins specifically, Elliot, do you know why? No, why? Initials JFK. Come on, man. Like, that's an obvious oh. one, isn't it? <laughs> Come on. It's kind of perfect. You know what, Jeff? I didn't even think of that. That's that. That's pretty good. Yeah. Okay, third one from a tweeter by the name of Tommy Garner. We talked about player with four teams in a single contract. Jamie Devan brought up Mark Arcabello. Here's another one. David Perron signed a four-year deal with St. Louis in 2012, traded to Edmonton, to Pittsburgh, then Anaheim, before signing back with St. Louis. So it wasn't one season like Arcabello, but it was a four-year deal where he ended up playing for four teams. Okay, let me. Can I add on to that one because I sure. had one executive text me two names for that one. This one was kind of fertile ground that we found here. I love this cleanup aspect here of the Montana's thought line. Um, about players playing for multiple teams on the same contract. One executive sent me two examples. One, Eric Goodbranson, who played for five teams on a three-year contract. And the other, and I'd forgotten about this. This is spectacular. UC Jokinen, four teams on one contract. Here they are. This is 2017-18. The Edmonton Oilers, the Los Angeles Kings, the Columbus Blue Jackets and the Vancouver Canucks. Hmm. Are you are you willing to crown him as our winner? Four teams, one year contract. Jeff, what it comes down to, I think, to answer your question, is is it more impressive to play on four teams in the same one year deal, 
or four teams over a four-year contract, which you think would buy you security? Hmm. I think it's the four teams on a one-year deal. Yeah, that's because you. Pre- that's because you presented it, Tommy <laughs> Garner on Twitter. I'm with you. And the last one, the last one is see Jeff's all for himself. Yeah. I am all for the listeners. I'm team uh, me. Oh, look, there's my navel. Hey, look, another mirror. Let me just hop in front. So I was when I was flying home from Fort Lauderdale on Wednesday. I ran into uh, a couple of uh, listeners. Their names were Brad and Jeff. They were from Montreal. And they told me that they went to a hockey camp where a friend of theirs who played goal had his hand broken by Gaston Gingra. There's another one? Another one. So it's not just Cassidy Sauve who's now playing It's not in just Finland? Cassidy Sauve, but there was wow. another... How a goalie many? who, and it was a shot from here. center ice. They said, they said they were listening to the podcast when you were talking about Cassidy Sauve and they were laughing. And when we ran into each other on Thursday or on Wednesday in Fort Lauderdale, they said, we were hoping someday we would get a chance to tell you this story, but their friend had his hand broken on a Gaston Gingra slap shot from center ice. And they also said, that when Gingra would get upset at the players because they weren't paying attention, he would turn and he would shoot. He would make sure nobody was there first, but he would shoot the puck over the glass at the wall of the arena to get everyone's attention. And that works. Here's my question. As we go down these roads of hockey geekdom, I wonder how many hands Gaston Gingra has broken. How many goalie hands has At Gaston Gingra broken? Well, we know two. We know that there are two. I suspect that there might be more. If you are someone who listens to this podcast, obviously, and knows of any more victims of the Gaston Gingra slap shot, please inform us <laughs> immediately. The way to get in touch is the Montana's Thought Line, which has now turned into like a detective service here. Find out That's how right. many hands Gaston Gingra has broken. 32 thoughts at sportsnet.ca or leave us a voicemail. Maybe you've had your hand broken by Gaston Gingra. 1-833-311-3232. This podcast has taken a weird turn. Any more cleanups, Elliot? No, those four. All right, those are good. Um, let's go to Niall in Scotland. Hey guys, big fan of the pod from Scotland. Thanks for all you do. Um, to me, you guys are like the news and chiclets are like the entertainment that's meant as a compliment to both. Anyhow, the recent chat around the Minnesota overtime goalie poll got me thinking. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So, say we have a game late in the season between two bottom feeders, Hawks and Ducks, for example, although their last game against each other is this week. What would happen if we got to, it was Thursday night as a matter of fact, what would happen if we get to overtime between them and both of them think, well, wait a minute. Well, we don't want one point, let alone two, and both pull their goaltenders hoping to go home with zero points and increase their lottery odds. Would this be allowed? Would the teams be penalized for lack of sporting integrity? Keen to hear your thoughts. Cheers and go Flames. So our friend in Scotland, Niall, is a Calgary Flames fan, Elliot. Hmm. Two teams at the end of the game pull well, the goaltenders. Well, I think the Flames should bring him to Calgary to go see a game in person, don't you? Clearly, absolutely. Get off your wallet. Bring our friend from Scotland to the Scotiabank Saddle Dome. <laughs> um, lack of sportsmanship. We're not here for the points. First of all, I don't I, see I, any way how they could stop them from doing it if two teams really wanted to do it. Maybe they hear this podcast and ask that question and prematurely step out and say, we're not allowing this to occur. But as far as I know, there's nothing that could prevent them from doing that. There's there there's nothing other than you just get the wrath and the scorn from the industry. And here's the thing, too. We've talked about this before. As much as managers and perhaps owners as well may want, you know, the team to fold to get yourself the better lottery odds, get a better draft pick, etc. Players don't think that way. Like, I've always thought about this. If you had a scenario, the likes of which that Niall submits here, what would a player do if their coach told them, go score on your own net? We need to lose this game. What would that player do? Because my guess is 
the player would tell the coach to go kick rocks. I'm not going out there and doing that to myself. Because I have, I have wondered about this scenario when a team wants a tank, whether it was the previous, you know, Mario Lemieux sweepstakes <laughs> that we mm -hmm. can all recall that battle between Pittsburgh and New Jersey. But I've always wondered, what would a player do if the coach on instructions from the manager said, we can't win this game. We need the better lottery odds. Go score on your own net. I'm guessing the majority, if not all, players on that team would say, not a chance. There's no way I'll do that. Uh, first of all, I would say, before I do that, do I have an eight-year, $64 million extension <laughs> yes. on the table? <laughs> Good point. Yeah. That would be my first thing. You know what? That would be the kind of thing where I, I could see the commissioner, who does have some power over this kind of thing, he would he would probably ha he would hammer a team with a huge fine. That's one of those things that that is detrimental to the game, and you if you can prove it, which you probably would be able to prove just by the video itself, you fine a team half a million dollars, something like that, and you suspend the coach. And I don't think anybody would protest that. Yeah, especially not you know considering how um, how sports wagering is such a huge thing, not just in hockey but in all of sports as well. That the uh, and this this wouldn't be subtle. The obviousness of um, poor behavior, or as our uh, emailer submits here, uh, Nile, um, a lack of sporting integrity. I couldn't see it happening, but I always have wondered: what would a player say? What would a player do? Okay, let's get to Ricky in Richmond, British Columbia. Hey, Elliot and Jeff, I read that Wayne Simmons signed a one-day contract to retire as a flyer. I yes. understand it is just a gesture to retire in a certain franchise, but has any player ever suited up and played a game on a one-day contract? Oh, yes, there has. Thanks mm. for your time. Love the pod. Try the ribs. Change your oil. Hey, Elliot, how about that? <laughs> he slides out. One. It's catching on. Nice. Too. There was one that I can think of. Who's that? Cordy Howe. Hmm. 1999. You'll remember this, Elliot. He signed with the Detroit Vipers. Oh, for yes, one yes, game. Yes. For one game. Uh, so he could say that he played in six different decades. The Gordy Howe one day contract. That's the only one that I can think of off the top of my head. Maybe further research and examination may come up with some other examples, but that's the one that popped to me right away. Gordie Howe, 1999, Detroit Vipers, who, by the way, had one of the coolest looking logos the game has ever seen. I love the Yes, that Vipers was logos. a great one. Oh, beautiful. I'm trying to think of if there's any NHL player who's played for a signed a one game contract. I mean, there's plenty of guys who've played one game. Yes. Ken Reed wrote a great book about it. I'm trying to think about one game contracts. I can't even think of anything like that. Nope. Um, I mean, in, in some way, the e-bugs can be one game contracts, but those are unique. Yeah. That doesn't, I don't, I don't think that fits what, um, what Ricky and Richmond BC is shooting for here. I wonder if Gordy's it. I really do. But we shall see. Let's uh, let's finish up with this one. Um, this is John from State College, PA, by way of Kingston, Ontario. Good afternoon. As the Buffalo Sabres are in the hunt for a playoff spot, I can't help but think about Jeff Skinner. Many people like to discuss great NHL players who have never won the Stanley Cup, but I've never heard a discussion surrounding great NHL players to never make a playoff appearance. Jeff Skinner is in his 14th NHL season, none of which have resulted in his Hurricanes or Sabres qualifying for the playoffs. The fact we had an expanded playoff in 2020 and his team didn't qualify makes this even crazier. This guy has played almost 1,000 career games with over 350 goals and nearly 700 points, but we've never seen him play when it matters the most. And just to make things worse, Carolina made the conference finals this season after Skinner left. Rough. This fact blows my mind every single year, so I'm wondering who comes to mind 
when you think of other longtime NHL players who never play on a playoff team. Take care and go Ducks. John is an Anaheim Ducks fan. There's a couple that come to mind for me. All right, why don't you go first? Ladislav Schmid is one. Speaking of Ducks, uh, Laddie Schmid would be one of those. Um, currently in the NHL, not just Jeff Skinner, and he is the one that, you know, much like uh, John at State College uh, mentions, I think about often too. Like I think a lot about Jeff Skinner, and you look at the Hockey DB, and it's bagels uh, for playoff appearances. Uh, Rasmus Ristolainen is someone who's never played. Well, the in, guy in who the did it last year was Sam Reinhart. Yes. Sam Reinhart was that guy. And then obviously he got traded to Florida and they went to the Stanley Cup final. Yep. Um, there's two more that came to mind for me. One, Guy Charon, who I think comes to mind for a lot of other uh, people yes, as well. Yes, that's the one I always remember from when I was a kid. Same. And then the netminder, Mike Dunham, uh, never played mm. a playoff game either. There was a few that were close. But Mike Dunham um, was on playoff teams, right? So... Dunham would have backed up Marty Berdour, but never gotten any playoff games. So maybe that's a technicality, Elliot. The other two that I think of who just have only a couple of games, <laughs> a couple of playoff games, but they've played over a thousand NHL games. One of them is one of our favorites, and that's Sam Gagne, who at the time of this recording has played 1,042 games in the regular season and 11 in the postseason. And Ole Jokinen. Who played right. 1,200, 1,231 regular season games and six in the postseason. I remember that. It took Jokinen a long oh. time. But Guy Chiron was always the one I remembered uh, as a kid because he had the longest one for a while. So that's kind of the one that sticks with me mm -hmm. because I just remember it growing up. Ron Hainsey was almost that guy. Right. He listens Ron to the Hainsey. pod, so he'll be happy to hear you bring that up. Well, he, I mean, his streak was broken by winning the Stanley Cup. Like, come on, you go from not playing in the playoffs. Like, how many That's players? Right. Was, if, if you would say to any player, okay, here's a question for you. Outhouse you to go the penthouse. To, you go to any player and you say, okay, here's the deal. You're going to have a 15-year NHL career. You're never going to make the playoffs until the one year that you finally do and you win the Stanley Cup. Are you cool with that? And they'll all say, "100 percent, I am." Yeah, if I if I knew I was guaranteed a cup win, it would be a hard one for me to live for that long. But if I knew there was gold at the end of the rainbow, totally. I would probably do it. If you're Haynes, you're like, oh, I'm slugging it out here with the Blue Jackets and Thrashers, and you know, welcome back to Manitoba Jets and Carolina, and then bam. Pittsburgh Penguins, and I'm holding the Stanley Cup after all those years of frustration. If I'm Ron Hainsey, oh yeah, oh yeah, I'm I'm, I'm taking that. That's that's a game worth the candle right there, hundred percent. So there we go. Uh, great question. Hope the answers were okay. Um, and I do think about. I think you do probably as well. Just get Jeff Skinner into the playoffs, please. Uh, thanks to everybody uh, who either emailed in or called in as well. We'll get to some voicemails coming up on the next. Edition of 32 Thoughts. Uh, this was the Montana's Thought Line, Montana's Barbecue and Bar, Canada's home for barbecue. 32 Thoughts at sportsnet.ca, 1 833 311 3232. Back in a moment. Podcast presented by the GMC Sierra Elevation. Quick reminder: uh, Hockey Night in Canada. Check Saturday the oil. At <laughs> I love it. You're forcing this. You're, you've walked into the hat shop. You've only found one hat, but damn it, you're going to make it fit. And I love <laughs> you for it, Elliot. Uh, Edmonton faces off against Toronto. Ottawa faces off against New Jersey. Late game: the Vancouver Canucks host the Calgary Flames. Um, to wrap up, Elliot, this was a tough week for hockey. Um, the sport losing uh, two players, uh, Konstantin Koltsov and also Chris Simon. Um, I talked to Mikhail Grabowski, who was close with uh, with Koltsov this week when he passed. And, you know, Grabo talked a lot about how, you know, they were roommates, they were teammates, wonderful guy. 
Um, I, I think, you know, Grabo, like a lot of his, you know, former teammates and friends were just devastated um, by the loss. Um, and I spoke to Todd Warner specifically about the passing of Chris Simon. And, you know, Warner said something that I've heard other people that played with Chris Simon echo. And that is when you first went into the dressing room with Chris Simon on your team, on the one hand, you're intimidated because he's such a large presence and a large man and, you know, was a scary, scary dude when he played like nobody messed with Chris Simon. Um, but then right away, he became A, your best friend and B, the friendliest and best teammate anyone ever anyone could ever have you know warner told me uh, all kinds of stories about you know this different side of chris simon that nobody got to see unless you were a teammate and he would have and they were with, they were with each other with the with the quebec nordiques have players elliot just howling in like in like you know your belly hurts laughter just a larger than life personality loved by his teammates uh, certainly loved by fans and missed by everybody, Elliot. First of all, those are great words, Jeff. I didn't know Colts love at all, but Colby Armstrong did. So, you know, reading and, and, and hearing Colby about him, um, uh, it's, it's really tough. The Chris Simon news is really tough. I've dealt with suicide in my life. I don't like it and I don't like talking about it. Um, I would just say that in both Canada and the U.S., there is 988 to call and text. Uh, as they say, help is available. Someone is always um, willing to listen. Um, you know, it, it, and I have a lot of deep feelings about this that I'm not going to get into on, on this pod. It's very personal, but I, I, I think it's, it's very sad and, uh, you know, one of the people I really think about here, and I haven't spoken to him yet, is, uh, is Glenn Healy. And Glenn runs the NHL Alumni Association, and he takes incredible pride in being able to help as many people as he can. And I know that this would be as hard a week for him as it would be for anyone outside of the families and the closest friends of Koltsov and Simon. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's... It's it's really hard. I, it brings back a lot of memories that I don't like thinking about, and uh, I feel terrible for the for the friends uh, and the family. And the the one thing I would say is that there's always someone willing to listen, always. And uh, I hope people who are going through a very bad place uh, find that person. Condolences to the family and the friends of Konstantin Koltsov and Chris Simon. Mm -hmm.